Well, good morning, everybody. Um, in my present uh, green view, I can't tell if anybody's actually out there uh, watching or listening, but I trust that uh, some of you are. Um, I decided to give this talk, and uh, over the years, every five or six years, uh, give a similar talk because it's become apparent that uh, breast cancer education is uh, one of the areas where uh, residents and students and fellows uh, often struggle. I can tell you that it's an area where I could fail every one of you on a breast cancer question and, and the place, for example, in surgical oncology uh, oral examinations for their boards uh, where the fellows have the most trouble, not the liver questions or the pancreas questions or the melanoma questions or sarcoma questions. It's the breast room because breast cancer is very complex. So this is breast cancer 101. I'm going to try and get through this talk uh, and cover the ground. I apologize if I, uh, if I haven't timed this properly. But here we go. I guarantee you'll pick up the answers to a couple of questions if you pay attention. All right, breast physiology. Very quickly, the breast is designed for one thing and one thing only. It's to feed babies. So it makes milk that's produced in the lobules, transported via the ducts to the nipple. Here's a duct lined by ductal epithelial cells with a lumen through which milk is transported. So by definition, there are two kinds of breast cancer. It arises either in the ducts or the lobules, ductal or lobular carcinoma. The key to uh, better results in breast cancer is early detection. What are the current guidelines? The American Cancer Society now says start at age 45, for average risk patients with the option if people want to start at age 40, others have given recommendations for age 50. And then if, whether you do it every year or every other year, it's still American Cancer Society says every year for the most part. What about annual breast examinations by a physician? The American Cancer Society now says, nope, don't do it. Leads to too many false positive uh, uh, physical exam findings and too many additional x-rays and biopsies, but they don't even recommend that a physician performs a breast examination, which I find odd. And breast self-examination, nope, that just causes women to worry too much and they never find anything that's, uh, you know, and they, they always find false positive things as well. So uh, I still think doing a breast exam like doing a rectal exam is uh, part of the physical examination that should be done every year, but what do I know? So when you get your mammograms, the radiologists are going to tell us whether there's anything on the imaging that is suspicious. And there's a classification a system for this, the BIRADS, you know, the Breast Imaging Radiology Classification System, uh, that is now a zero to six scale. It used to be one to five, but zero essentially means it's incomplete. You need additional studies before you can make a final determination. And six means you already know that it's a cancer. So we'll discount those for now. One and two are benign. Don't have to worry about it. Three is probably benign, but you probably have to get a six month follow up mammogram or ultrasound. Four is suspicious. And now there's four A, B, and C. Uh, but four in general has meant, you know, about a 20% chance of having breast cancer. So even though suspicious, not uh, diagnostic. But you can see based upon A, B, or C, the risk goes up. You see 4C, you better be uh, uh, worried about cancer, but even for A and B. If you see it, BIRADS 4, get a biopsy. BIRADS 5 is a lesion uh, that is almost half a mnemonic for breast cancer. Um, 
and 95% or greater uh, risk. You know, you see a speculated mass that's characteristic of breast cancer. Uh, that's something that's almost certainly breast cancer, but hasn't been biopsied yet. So pay attention to BIRADS. BIRADS four means, or higher means get a biopsy. So how do we do a biopsy? We do it by image guidance. Uh, most of the time now. That is, uh, rather than the old fashioned excisional breast biopsy, by ultrasound, by stereotactic biopsy, which is a mammographically guided system, or by MRI now, you can do an image guided biopsy and put a needle right into the lesion and get a diagnosis. This is a core needle biopsy. This uh, provides histology, not cytology. You can get receptor status and the information you need for determining therapy. And this is standard of care for how you treat uh, breast lesions that need a biopsy. So when do you use ultrasound and when do you use a stereotactic biopsy that's driven by a mammogram where a computer driven system puts a needle right into the coordinates where the lesion is seen? Well, everybody gets, a lot of people get this question wrong. You see microcalcifications in the breast and they order an ultrasound guided biopsy. Of course, you cannot see microcalcifications on ultrasound, so ultrasound is not gonna be a good way to do a biopsy. If you can see a mass on ultrasound, such as this one, which is a, got your regular borders, it's got posterior shadowing, it's taller than it is wide, it's characteristic for breast cancer, then, if you can see it on ultrasound, you do an ultrasound guided biopsy. That's the easiest way to get a biopsy. Uh, easiest for the patient, uh, good way to get a diagnosis. But if you can't see the lesion on ultrasound, then you can do a stereotactic biopsy. If it was seen on mammogram, then you do a stereotactic biopsy. If it's only seen on MRI, then you can get an MRI, which is something I'm not gonna talk about much. What about excisional breast biopsy? Well, I will caution you that there are some breast lesions when patients present with a palpable mass in their breast and they get a mammogram and an ultrasound uh, and they say it's normal, but there's still a palpable mass. This is a classic question because uh, that's often uh, infiltrating lobular carcinoma, which is like a stealth cancer that doesn't show up on imaging frequently. I've had a patient who went to the doctor because she thought her right breast was swelling. She saw a doctor, she saw a plastic surgeon, she had mammogram and ultrasound, all were normal. Still, it became apparent that her right breast wasn't swelling, her left breast was shrinking. By the time she saw me, her whole left breast was all hard and shrunken and a, a random biopsy, even though the imaging didn't show cancer showed infiltrating lobular carcinoma, and every one of her axillary lymph nodes was positive. So beware about uh, palpable masses that have normal imaging. You still should consider doing a biopsy. But if you have a mass like that, you can certainly get it, get a, a, a biopsy done, sometimes with a, a core needle biopsy in the office. Now. Another point that students always get wrong because they've never seen this or thought about it apparently and, uh, is, well, how do you do an excision of a lesion if you can't palpate it? How would you actually localize it? Well, the old fashioned way is called needle localization breast biopsy. Under mammogram with the breast in compression, the radiologist numbs it up and puts in a needle into the lesion and through that needle places a wire with a hook on the end of it, a hook wire that stays in place. And the woman comes to the operating room with a wire sticking out of her breast. I know it uh, seems still kind of old fashioned and barbaric, but still a very useful strategy. So then at the time of surgery, you use all the tools at your disposal to know the length of the embedded wire and the location direction to make an incision and go in. You don't necessarily start at the wire here. Sometimes a wire is placed all the way across the breast, the wire is placed out here and the tip of the wire is out here. You don't start where the wire goes in. You go overlying the tip of the wire. You can use ultrasound and see where the tip of the wire is and you jiggle it and that kind of thing. But 
that's one way. A newer way is to use a radioactive seed localization where a radioactive seed is placed and you can use the gamma probe that we use for sentinel node biopsy or there are newer systems that are, have different guidance systems based on radio frequency or magnets uh, to do the same thing with a, with a seed placed in there. And that's a very useful technique that we often use now. But then you excise the lesion. That's an excisional breast biopsy. Sometimes we still have to do that. Now, what are some high-risk lesions that you need to be aware of that uh, might show up on an imaging report uh, that you need to be aware of so you can make proper decisions? Well, a couple of them are these things. If you see radial scar, just tuck that in the back of your mind, complex sclerosing lesion. Uh, there's a, you know, there's some controversy about whether you need to re -excise, to excise all of these, but in general, the guidance has been if you get a radial scar and you do a, a image guided biopsy, it shows it's benign radial scar. Still, you should be asking the question, does it need to be excised to rule out cancer? And that's uh, uh, often a, a reasonable thing to do. Same thing with intraductal papilloma, which is within the duct. It's a benign lesion, but often has a higher risk of breast cancer or associated DCIS. And whether you should excise this or just do a, a coronal biopsy, depending upon the pathology and your radiologist, uh, is a multidisciplinary discussion. But introductal papilloma, remember, can be associated with a higher risk of cancer as well as radial scar. So just try to remember that. The other thing is atypical ductal hyperplasia and atypical lobular hyperplasia. Atypical ductal hyperplasia, as you're going to see here in our discussion about ductal carcinoma in situ, looks just like ductal carcinoma in situ because the difference between atypical ductal hyperplasia and ductal carcinoma in situ is really how much of it you see on the pathology slide. If you see just a little bit, it's atypical ductal hyperplasia. If you see more of it, then it's DCIS. So therefore, you can understand that just doing a sample biopsy with a needle may underestimate the true extent of it. An excisional biopsy is recommended in most cases. So therefore, you just remember ADH, excisional biopsy. For your purposes, you're gonna do that every time. Atypical lobular hyperplasia, which is similar uh, concept of atypical hyperplasia short of lobular carcinoma in situ. Uh, this uh, can indicate, indicate, both of these indicate a higher risk of developing breast cancer to some degree. Uh, not typically recommended that you have to re-excise all of these, but I can tell you if I see atypical anything, I'm considering doing an excisional biopsy to be sure that there's not associated breast cancer and have found in my career uh, breast cancer in, in both of these instances. So radial scar, intraductal papilloma, atypical ductal or lobular hyperplasia, just remember those things might need to be excised even though you had a coronal biopsy. And that's a good discussion to have with your radiologist, pathologist, and others. First thing everybody always tells me when we ask breast cancer questions and uh, a biopsy needs to be done, and the students will say, well, we'll just do an FNA, a fine needle aspiration biopsy. Well, in my mind, FNA has a limited role in breast cancer. Why is that? It has a high false negative rate, I guess, in some institutions where they do it for everything, it, it's, it can be very good. But in most places, you're going to have a high false negative rate. You can't differentiate between invasive cancer and ductal carcinoma in situ by FNA because it's cytology rather than histology. You're sucking out some cells out of the, the lesion and putting them on a slide. You also usually don't have enough tissue or cells to be able to get reliable receptor information. You need to know uh, ER, PR, uh, HER2 status uh, these days in order to make proper treatment decisions. So don't use FNA for routine diagnosis. It can be useful for recurrent breast cancer or for, for diagnosing whether there's cancer in lymph nodes uh, that are seen on ultrasound or, or palpable lymph nodes. But uh, for diagnosis of the breast cancer, steer clear of FNA in general. 
So let's clarify some technology, some uh, terminology, because there's a lot of confusion. Most people think that lumpectomy, which sounds like a rather colloquial term, and it is, is the same thing as an excisional biopsy, and it's not. A lumpectomy is a cancer operation. Excisional biopsy is for diagnosis, and no attempt is made to get negative margins. And so if you do an excisional biopsy, remember it's a biopsy. A lumpectomy is a cancer operation for breast conserving resection of breast cancer, even if there's no lump, if it's just for microcalcifications associated with DCIS, we still call it a lumpectomy, many people do. Uh, but lumpectomy also has other names, partial mastectomy, segmental mastectomy, even though there are no segments of the breast, quadrantectomy, that's a big lumpectomy, wide local excision, which is uh, what we call our melanoma operation, uh, tyrolectomy, these are all terms that mean lumpectomy. For my money, I think lumpectomy is probably the simplest thing to say so that patients understand. If you tell the patients you're doing a partial mastectomy, they think you're taking out half their breast. Uh, lumpectomy uh, at least captures the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish, which is preserve the breast by removing the breast cancer and some surrounding normal tissue and try to preserve the appearance of the breast to the degree possible. So breast conservation is lumpectomy, and for your purposes, whenever you say the word lumpectomy, you're always going to say the word radiation therapy. We're going to talk about when you might not need radiation therapy a little bit, but the, the rule is if you do breast conservation, you give radiation therapy. So practice saying lumpectomy, the next word off, off, out of your mouth is always radiation therapy. And then there's the terminology regarding mastectomy. So total mastectomy or simple mastectomy is the same thing as total mastectomy, is removal of the breast without removing any lymph nodes. Modified radical mastectomy is total mastectomy with an axillary lymph node dissection. And a radical mastectomy is a total mastectomy, axillary dissection, and removing the pectoralis major muscle like they used to do in the old days and we rarely do anymore. If you have a breast cancer, and usually if you have one that's invading into the pectoralis major muscle, uh, that patient's usually going to wind up getting preoperative or neoadjuvant chemotherapy or systemic therapy. If it invades into the muscle somewhat, do you need to remove the whole muscle? No, you can just remove the part of the muscle that's deep margin and not have to remove the whole pectoralis major muscle in most cases. So another concept I want to get across to you is management of the breast and management of the lymph nodes and what are the goals of each. You must dissociate in your mind the goals of each of the treatment options for the breast and, and breast cancer and for the lymph nodes. Lumpectomy or mastectomy are your options for local disease control to remove the breast cancer and prevent it from coming back in the breast. Axillary dissection or sentinel node biopsy is for staging of the lymph nodes in the axilla and possibly achieving regional disease control. When we say regional disease control, we refer to regional lymph node disease most of the time. Radiation therapy, like surgery, is also a local therapy. It prevents local recurrence or, and or regional recurrence. It does not prevent systemic recurrence and uh, it doesn't improve survival in breast conservation but it reduces the risk of local recurrence. Now, there's some controversy as to whether post-mastectomy radiation therapy improves survival by improving local recurrence, but for our purposes, it's a local therapy. Chemotherapy and hormonal therapy are for systemic disease control to prevent it from spreading to other places and, and also helps with local and regional disease control. So what do I mean by local disease control? Well, you may not know what it is, but if you lose it, you certainly figure it out pretty quickly. This is loss of local disease control on the chest wall, in the breast. Now this patient has an unresectable chest wall recurrence, and that's a major problem. If you get to this point, you failed in your mission as the cancer surgeon to achieve local disease control. Regional disease control, what does that mean? If we lose regional disease control, that means when you have bulky, unresectable, axillary, nodal metastasis that's now invading and encasing the axillary vein, 
uh, brachial plexus and other structures that can't be resected. Then the patients have horrible, miserable, painful uh, problem. Now this doesn't happen very often, but I show these slides to remind you of your solemn uh, duty as a cancer surgeon to achieve local and regional disease control because we cure patients with surgery only by virtue of the fact that we resect their local and regional disease completely and that it doesn't come back in some cases. This is the most important slide that I'm going to show you today. This is the framework by which you can understand breast cancer. If you don't remember anything else, at least remember this two by two table that provides a framework for helping you to understand breast cancer. Breast cancer, as I've already said, arises either in the lobules or the ducts. There are only two kind, two structures that are in the breast that are going to make breast cancer, except for some rare things. Almost and other things. Don't worry about those. So breast cancer also is either non-invasive or invasive. Now the invasive cancers we'll talk about at the end. Everybody knows the treatment options for that. And uh, while, while it gets very complicated as well, where people often stumble is right here, non-invasive breast cancers, because it is not intuitive. You cannot reason your way out of this because it sometimes doesn't make sense. So you have to know it. You have to memorize it. You have to practice it. You have to go to breast clinic and take part in multidisciplinary breast cancer discussions in order to understand it. So, remember, Infiltrating is the same thing as invasive. When we say infiltrating ductal carcinoma, that means invasive uh, uh, ductal carcinoma or lobular carcinoma. That's the kind that can metastasize the lymph nodes or hematogenously to other places that can spread and kill you. That means the same thing. Non-invasive lobular cancer is called lobular carcinoma. And right off the bat, it gets very confusing because lobular carcinoma in situ, which looks like this, is not cancer. It's an incidental finding on a breast biopsy. Beware of uh, mammographic pathologic discordance. So if you see a spiculated mass on the mammogram and they do a biopsy and it says LCIS, uh, you got to be thinking, well, they missed it and there's cancer there. This is an incidental finding that's often seen on the breast biopsy, but if you have a suspicious mass or other finding on imaging and all you see is LCIS, then you may have missed it. So uh, image guided breast biopsy is pretty good. It's you know probably 97%, 98%, 99% accurate. It's not 100% accurate. So as I said, LCIS is not cancer. What is it? If you, if you leave it alone in the breast, it will not turn into cancer. All LCIS is, it's like a bad family history of breast cancer. It indicates an increased risk of developing breast cancer in either breast, infiltrating ductal carcinoma or lobular cancer throughout the woman's lifetime, approximately a 1% per year risk of getting breast cancer in either breast. So therefore, if you find LCIS on a core needle biopsy, you don't have to go back and do a lumpectomy for it because it is not the thing that's going to turn into cancer. It just means a woman has an increased risk of getting breast cancer. Most of the cancers that are going to develop after finding LCIS are infiltrating ductal carcinoma, in fact. So doing a lumpectomy for it certainly won't help. And giving radiation therapy certainly isn't going to help. Usually these don't progress to in, uh, invasive lobular carcinoma. They're usually ductal cancers if they get breast cancer. So again, it's a marker approximately of increased risk of about 1% per year, equal risk in both breasts. So what makes sense for management of LCIS? Well, think about it. If the risk is getting breast cancer in either breast, and it's 1% per year, um, one option is just observation. Clinical examination every six months, annual mammogram, and quite possibly MRI for surveillance. So you watch closely. Well, is there anything that you can do to reduce the risk of getting breast cancer? 1% per year starts to add up when you, uh, as you get older. So the NSABP B, uh, P1 study 
looked at this issue and giving tamoxifen reduces the risk of getting breast cancer, cuts the risk almost in half. So one strategy is to give chemo prevention with tamoxifen to reduce the risk of getting breast cancer in addition to close surveillance. And then if you're going to do surgery, there's only one option that makes sense, which is a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. Doesn't make sense to do mastectomy on one side. Doesn't make sense to do max, uh, to do a lumpectomy. Doesn't make sense to give radiation therapy. Doesn't make sense to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy because there, this again is not cancer unless you find an associated cancer. So bilateral mastectomy with reconstruction if the woman desires it. Uh, often skin sparing or uh, nipple sparing mastectomy can be uh, just. So classic globular carcinoma in situ is just what I described. Indicates an increased risk of getting breast cancer in either breast. There's no need to get negative margins. There's no need to re-excise it. You take one of the strategies of observation, chemo prevention with tamoxifen or bilateral mastectomy, and uh, that is sufficient. But as with every rule, there is an exception, and that is there's something called pleomorphic or atypical LCIS, type B LCIS, which is a different animal, which acts like ductal carcinoma in situ and will progress or can progress to invasive lobular carcinoma. So again, in the back of your mind, remember, if you see this, pleomorphic or atypical, anything that says atypical, you need to be uh, doing a little more homework to figure out what that really means in breast cancer. Uh, this you got to treat like DCIS. Most of the time, LCIS is just what I talked about. So uh, it has uh, different looking cells, may present with microcalcification, just like ductal carcinoma in situ, behaves like low grade DCIS, and you treat it the same way. So the key points for lobular carcinoma in situ, classic uh, LCIS is, is not a true a pre-invasive lesion. It's a marker of increased risk of getting breast cancer in either breast. We talked about the management options. Beware of this pleomorphic or atypical DCI or LCIS and treat it like DCIS. Okay, you got that one down. Now it starts to get more complicated, believe it or not, because non-invasive ductal carcinoma is called appropriately ductal carcinoma in situ. Beware of the term intraductal carcinoma. What does that mean? It sounds a lot like infiltrating ductal carcinoma. And in fact, over the years, I've seen uh, several patients who had the diagnosis of intraductal carcinoma, treated as if they had infiltrating ductal carcinoma, but really they just had DCIS, which is what that means. So most pathologists these days don't, will say ductal carcinoma in situ, but intraductal carcinoma means DCIS, doesn't mean infiltrating ductal carcinoma. So DCIS, by definition, doesn't penetrate the basement membrane. It's in situ. It's precancerous. It's stage zero in situ. But it's a true pre-malignant lesion, like having you know, uh, colon polyps that progress to colon cancer or melanoma in situ that progresses to melanoma. Most often, if you leave it alone long enough, it's going to turn into invasive ductal carcinoma. There's controversy about small incidental non-high-grade DCIS in older patients, and we'll talk about that just a little bit. But again, off, most often it's going to turn into, uh, into breast cancer if you leave it alone long enough and watch it long enough. Now, there's actually a study going on right now, the COMET trial, because there's controversy, especially in older women with non-high-grade DCIS, that this may be something like prostate cancer in men that you can watch and, and, and uh, won't ever turn into invasive cancer in their lifetime that would require them to undergo surgery. So rather than doing a mastectomy or a lumpectomy and radiation therapy and hormonal therapy, uh, this COMET trial randomizes patients to standard surgical therapy versus active surveillance with or without hormonal therapy for risk reduction. But it's only in patients who are older than 40 with uh, non-high-grade DCIS. It's ER positive uh, and no mass or on physical exam or imaging. So you have to rule out uh, um, 
that there's actually associated breast cancer. And we don't know the results of this yet, but probably, especially the patients who are being enrolled in the study who are, you know, 80 years old with low-grade DCIS that's going to take years and years to turn into invasive breast cancer, it may be a reasonable strategy. There is a spectrum from normal ductal epithelium to benign proliferative changes to atypical hyperplasia that we talked about to ductal carcinoma in situ. You see this uh, ductal carcinoma in situ with this pro proliferation of atypical cells, often with this uh, cellular debris within the lumen that gets calcified. That's why you see microcalcifications on mammogram to invasive breast cancer and genetic changes that go along with it. DCIS was rare prior to the 1980s before mammogram screening became uh, commonplace, uh, and now it's about 15% of the breast cancers that we see, and it's often seen because of microcalcifications. So what does it look like? Well, it can show up as calcifications. It can show up as a soft tissue density on mammogram or both or a palpable mass, but if you find a palpable mass or a mass at all on imaging, you got to be thinking if the biopsy says DCIS that there may be a higher risk that there's also an associated invasive component to the cancer. It's already turned into an invasive cancer, most often calcifications. Now high-grade uh, DCIS, uh, this is going to turn into breast cancer and, and necrosis is a key component most of them calcify in a way you can detect on mammogram. You see a mammogram that looks like this, all these microcalcifications in a ductally oriented pattern, uh, that's DCIS. This is not a patient who you're gonna do a lumpectomy for, this is widespread DCIS. You can tell that you have to do a mastectomy for that. You, you'll see the cellular debris uh, uh, produced by DCIS, it turns into this chunks of calcification, and that's what you see on the mammogram. Now, non-high-grade DCIS can present a problem, grade one and two, because it doesn't calcify as readily and show up the same way. It can show up as little cloud-like segments of pleomorphic calcifications, uh, small areas of, of, of indeterminate calcifications, things that not quite as clear-cut as to whether or not in and if you ever uh, spend time looking at mammograms and see the things that the radiologists can see and detect that, that I never would have found, you'll have some newfound respect for breast imagers. Now, this can be DCIS, and this you'll see calcifications. Calcifications are often normal uh, in the breast as patients get older. There's a lot of reason, vascular calcifications, other things. This doesn't look particularly like cancer, but it can be. And trying to make that determination whether it needs a biopsy or not is not an easy decision sometimes. Ductal carcinoma in situ also can present as a nipple discharge, bloody nipple discharge. So if you find that, you can get a ductogram as one strategy to see if there are intraductal filling defects like you see here. And sometimes they can do an image-guided, ultrasound-guided biopsy uh, with a core needle, or you can sometimes have to excise the duct by localizing it to get a diagnosis. Bloody nipple discharge, however, requires further evaluation. The other presentation of ductal carcinoma in situ is Paget's disease. Now, what in the world is Paget's disease? Everybody's trying to remember. Well, everybody knows it's a rash or excoriation at the nipple that can look like that. Well, what in the world is it? Think of it simply as ductal carcinoma in situ growing up through the uh, ducts of the nipple onto the skin. That's ductal carcinoma in situ crawling out of the nipple onto the skin around the nipple. So if you see that, you have to do a biopsy. You can do a punch biopsy. You, you certainly want to get breast imaging because often uh, there's an associated invasive breast cancer under the nipple. They have to rule out invasive breast cancer, but it may just be ductal carcinoma in situ underneath the nipple. And you would treat it as ductal carcinoma in situ, which can be, as we'll talk about, a lumpectomy with radiation therapy, plus minus hormonal therapy, 
or a mastectomy. You can do a central lumpectomy that requires removal of the nipple, uh, nipple rear of the complex, and often that's a good option for patients. Some patients don't want that and want a mastectomy. So uh, biopsy, uh, usually for microcalcifications, this is where you use stereotactic biopsy, ultrasound won't see microcalcifications. Now realize when you see ductal, uh, uh, what you think is DCIS with calcifications, there may be infiltrating ductal carcinoma that's already uh, developed hiding within that DCIS. So there's an upgrade rate to invasive or, or microinvasive cancer between 10 and 35% when you do an image-guided core needle biopsy. We saw this yesterday in one of our patients who had a biopsy at an outside hospital for microcalcifications that showed non-high-grade DCIS. Yet when we reviewed the mammograms here, our radiologist found that there was a lot more going on in the breast and eventually we thought she was a good candidate for lumpectomy. Uh, well, found to have uh, associated multicentric infiltrating ductal carcinoma with further imaging and biopsies that led to a change in management. This patient was a, not a candidate for breast conservation, had to have a mastectomy and sent to a biopsy. So whenever you see DCIS or calcifications, you're doing a biopsy, recognize that there could be invasive cancer lurking in there somewhere. Even with uh, uh, excisional biopsy, sometimes the same thing can happen. The localization excisional biopsy sometimes is, is necessary, but rarely. We talked about atypical ductal hyperplasia and the fact that often it's a matter of debris. Here's a picture of DCIS. It's pretty, I think. These Roman bridges and some of the high grade doesn't look as pretty, but um, sometimes, but um, that's what it looks like. So what are the options for ductal carcinoma in situ? So it's precancerous in situ. These options don't make any sense. Why would you give radiation therapy for something that's precancerous? Why would you give hormonal systemic therapy for something that's precancerous? You don't do that for other kinds of precancerous things that we take out. Well, again, it's not intuitive. You have to know this, have to memorize it, have to learn it, have to practice it. The options are partial mastectomy or lumpectomy, we'll call it, plus radiation therapy. We'll talk about uh, hormonal therapy and radiation therapy here in a minute. Or mastectomy with sentinel node biopsy, plus or minus reconstruction. Mastectomy or lumpectomy with radiation therapy, because when you say lumpectomy, you always say radiation therapy. So breast conservation for DCIS, if you do a lumpectomy, again, it's not an excisional biopsy where you just cut something out and flop it in the pan and send it off to pathology. You have to be sure that you've oriented the specimen. Superior, mark the specimen with sutures. If you take out something like this, you need three sutures to mark superior, you know, mark three margins. So uh, superior, lateral, anterior, or whatever three margins you want to mark. Often, if the lesion is close to the skin, even if I don't need to remove skin, I will take a little sliver of skin at least so I have accurate anterior or superficial margin orientation of the lesion. lesion. Make sure the pathologists are going to ink the margins, cut it, and look at the margins. Some people do shave margins uh, from the cavity after you do the lumpectomy. I've never been able to figure out. I learned early on that sampling the margins uh, is not a good strategy. So actually do shave of each of those margins to adequately take an additional margin and be sure that you have adequate margins. I'm not sure you're taking out more breast tissue. I'm not sure if you've actually covered all the margins and I'm not sure that I trust that strategy, but some people have there's data uh, and some people uh, do that. Uh, my preference is to do your best lumpectomy. You do a specimen mammogram to see if the lesion is in the center. You can do two views. We have an intraoperative specimen mammogram machine that we use now. And then send it to pathology for permanent section, generally if it's microcalcifications. Because what are you going to do with this specimen is one question. Can you, you certainly want to give the patient the best chance of having a negative margin at the day of operation. 
Some people do touch preps in some institutions. We don't do that very much here. Well, you say, well, we'll send it for frozen section. And the pathologist immediately says, we can't freeze breast tissue. There's too much artifact. It's fat. You can't freeze fat. And you're not going to get good margin assessment. So basically, unless you have a mass, if you have a mass there, they can ink it, cut it, and look at the gross margin and measure it and tell you if you're close to a margin. That's one way to do it. But if it's just for microcalcifications, probably best just to send it for a permanent section. Be sure that you've used your imaging to help guide any margin re-excision at the time of surgery and send that separately and mark the true margin. Uh, place clips to mark the lumpectomy cavity. Some people do this, some people don't. Uh, so radiation therapy. Why on earth would we give radiation therapy for ductal carcinoma in situ? Because the risk of ipsilateral recurrence is high without radiation therapy. therapy. Um, 30 to 40 percent of DCIS will recur if you just do a lumpectomy without radiation. That's pretty high. The problem is that half of the time if it recurs, it's no longer just DCIS, it's invasive cancer, the kind that can spread to lymph nodes and systemically and kill you. So we want to prevent that if at all possible. Radiation therapy cuts the risk of ipsilateral breast recurrence in half. So classic study NSABP, National Surgical Adjuvant Breast and Bowel Project, a cooperative group study, B17, B for breast. Patients with ductal carcinoma in situ randomized a lumpectomy or a lumpectomy with radiation therapy. Radiation therapy cut the risk of recurrence in half. That's why we use radiation therapy. 15.7% is still a significant risk. Was well, there anything else we can do to reduce the risk of it rec uh, recurring in that breast or elsewhere? Well, how about hormonal therapy with tamoxifen? Uh, so NSABP B24 is a study that randomized patients who all got lumpectomy and radiation therapy for DCIS to either placebo or tamoxifen. And it reduces the risk of breast cancer significantly, of re breast cancer recurrence. Ipsilateral and cuts the risk of getting a contralateral breast cancer. You can see here that the benefit of hormonal therapy was seen in reducing breast cancer recurrences in estrogen receptor positive DCIS, but not in patients who had estrogen receptor negative DCIS. So we never used to check receptor status on DCIS in the old days. Now we do, and if they have ER positive DCIS, we give them hormonal therapy with tamoxifen or uh, aromatase inhibitor. So here's a summary. Here's DCIS, this is breast cancer recurrence. If you just do a lumpectomy, 30, and it keeps going up, it's not like it stops here. The longer you follow, the higher the risk gets. 30, 40% recurrence without any additional therapy, just doing a lumpectomy with negative margins. If you give radiation therapy, you cut that risk in half. If you give hormonal therapy, you cut the risk even further now to the range where it seems uh, practical to save the breast. The gold standard for DCIS is, is mastectomy, however, not to say that you should do a mastectomy for every patient with DCIS, but you need to think about, is this patient who, a uh, patient who should have a lumpectomy or radiation therapy uh, or have a mastectomy? If you do a mastectomy for pure DCIS, you know, 1% of the patients will have a recurrence. And survival is 99% approximately for, for patients who have a mastectomy for DCIS. So the problem is, uh, if you have patients who are at very high risk for local recurrence, that is young patients with high-grade DCIS, with large DCIS, with close margins, uh, you know, under age 40, you need to be thinking, well, maybe this patient really would be better served having a mastectomy rather than a lifetime risk of getting invasive breast cancer. Because the people who die from DCIS are the ones who develop an invasive uh, breast cancer recurrence. So is lumpectomy alone without radiation therapy ever sufficient? Well, uh, the answer in general is uh, generally not. The recurrence rate, again, you know, somewhere in the 40% range, half of the recurrences will be invasive, not DCIS. Uh, Mel Silverstein is one of the people who tried to figure out which patients 
could undergo a lumpectomy alone without giving radiation therapy because he hated giving his breast cancer patients radiation therapy for relatively favorable uh, DCIS. This is one scoring system that was developed for looking at this. I'm not going to go through it in detail, except the factors that take into account are the size of the DCIS. When it gets to four centimeters or more, you're thinking this is a high risk for local recurrence. The margin width, if you get 10 millimeter margins for all of your DCIS, you're a better surgeon than I am, uh, but certainly if you have a very close margin, uh, you want to get two millimeter margins for DCIS. You know, for invasive cancer, the, the accepted margin is, is uh, is no tumor on ink, but you want a little better margin than that for DCIS. And high grade with, with comedonecrosis is a high risk factor in young patients. So what does all that mean? Uh, for those of you who can't remember how to uh, calculate these kind of things while you're seeing patients, give radiation therapy to every DCIS patient who's getting uh, a lumpectomy, along with hormonal therapy if they're ER positive, except you can consider a lumpectomy as the only treatment in older women with small areas of DCIS that's not high grade with no necrosis and widely negative margins. Then you could have a discussion, a multidisciplinary discussion about could this patient potentially just have hormonal therapy or not undergo uh, radiation therapy. So I'm not going to go through this slide except to tell you a randomized trial comparing mastectomy uh, versus breast conservation for DCIS has never been performed and never will be performed. But that's the point is that if you have patients who are at very high risk for local recurrence that we talked about, you should be thinking, would they be better served with a mastectomy? Sensible lymph node biopsy for DCIS. Now, DCIS by definition does not spread to lymph nodes. It's non-invasive and it's cured 98 to 99% of the time without ever touching the axillary lymph nodes. So axillary dissection was abandoned long ago for this. So why should we do a sentinel lymph node biopsy for DCIS? Well, the answer is you shouldn't if you're doing a lumpectomy. However, sometimes DCIS on core needle biopsy is found to have an upgrade to invasive cancer up to 35% of the time, as we talked about. Uh, and we're not going to talk about immunohistochemistry today. Just don't do it because it shows you false positive things in the lymph nodes. Uh, but DCIS, you know, uh, only 1% of patients approximately with DCIS are going to have axillary nodal metastasis. That means that they had invasive breast cancer that was unrecognized. So who should have a sentinel node biopsy for DCIS? You should not do sentinel node biopsy for every patient who has a lumpectomy for DCIS. It's for patients who are undergoing mastectomy. Why? Because you can't go back and do a sentinel lymph node biopsy later if you found occult invasive cancer. You've disrupted the lymphatic drainage pathway. So therefore, when you're doing a mastectomy, you're looking at the lymph nodes anyway. You should do a sentinel node biopsy just in case within that breast there's actually invasive cancer. Then you can stage the lymph nodes. If you're doing a lumpectomy for DCIS and you find invasive cancer, you could always go back and do a sentinel lymph node biopsy later if you had to. Of course, if you're doing a, a lumpectomy for a patient with a, for DCIS that has a palpable mass or other high risk features, you can certainly consider doing a sentinel node biopsy. But in general, you don't need to. So in summary, partial mastectomy or lumpectomy and radiation therapy, no sentinel node biopsy, plus or minus hormonal therapy, depending upon ER status. Total mastectomy with sentinel lymph node biopsy with reconstruction. Uh, hormonal therapy for contralateral breast risk reduction. If you do bilateral mastectomy, you don't need to consider hormonal therapy because you've removed both breasts. Now, invasive cancer arising either in the ducts or lobules is infiltrating ductal or lobular cancer. Mercifully for you, they're treated the same. This is infiltrating ductal carcinoma. This is infiltrating lobular carcinoma. As we talked about, this can be an occult cancer, a stealth cancer that's not seen on imaging, that's a palpable mass that you need to biopsy. Uh, Indian filing of these little smaller cells that look like lymphocytes uh, that can cause this sclerosing kind of pattern that uh, doesn't form the kind of mass that, DCI, that uh, invasive ductal cancer does. Uh, 
So what are the options? You all know this already. Mastectomy, central node biopsy, uh, axillary dissection if you find a positive lymph node versus lumpectomy, radiation therapy, and central node biopsy for uh, invasive breast cancers, either ductal or lobular. Who doesn't need radiation therapy? Who has invasive breast cancer? Well, you should at least be considering that in some older patients who have favorable breast cancers, uh, women 70 and older, based on this CALGB 9343 study, that uh, lumpectomy with uh, hormonal therapy only uh, may be sufficient, although there is a higher risk of local recurrence. It's uh, no difference in survival. So um, many people and older women, you don't want to get radiation therapy. We'll just do a lumpectomy and hormonal therapy for the typical uh, well differentiated, grade one or two, ER positive, low KI67, old woman breast cancer, sometimes in older patients. Lumpectomy alone is enough. And in fact, we consider not doing central no biopsy either if we know we're just going to give them hormonal therapy regardless. As time has gone on, we've done less radical surgery for breast cancer. We've gone from doing modified radical mastectomies and radical mastectomies to saving the breast, now saving the lymph nodes. And that's based on classic studies like NSABP B04, one of the first uh, really a, a, a radical concept in its day that we would take patients and randomize them to, either with, to radical mastectomy or a mastectomy with radiation therapy without taking out the lymph nodes or just doing a total mastectomy alone. Whether they had negative or positive lymph nodes, it made no difference. Overall survival, 25 years of follow-up. What does this mean? Whatever we do, the lymph nodes isn't going to improve survival. It stages the patient, indicates what their risk of recurrence and death is, but it's not going to affect survival for the most case. Another large study that showed the same thing. So in general, probably what we do to the lymph nodes isn't affecting survival, but it affects staging, affects adjuvant therapy decisions. Is it necessary to perform a completion lymph node dissection if you find a positive sentinel node for invasive breast cancer? Well, this is the ACASOG Z11 study that you hear people always talk about that randomized patients who were undergoing uh, lumpectomy and whole breast radiation therapy with a plan for whole breast radiation therapy, the standard radiation therapy. Patients who had a sentinel node biopsy alone uh, had an axillary uh, recurrence rate of 1.3% versus 0.6%. So in other words, you don't need to do a um, completion lymph node dissection if you find one or two positive lymph nodes. That's why we don't send, we're doing a lumpectomy, do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, we, find, we don't send those lymph nodes for frozen section to do an axillary dissection on the same day because most of the time we're not going to do an axillary dissection at all. It reduces the risk of lymphedema uh, and gives patients uh, uh, less uh, need for axillary surgery because it turns out the radiation therapy as well as systemic therapy, radiation therapy that we give, when you give whole breast radiation therapy, the tangential field radiation covers a large part of level one uh, axilla and probably reduces the risk of nodal recurrence in addition to systemic therapy. But this is not a good strategy for T3 or T4 breast cancers. What to do with the lymph nodes in patients undergoing mastectomy. The standard for your purposes, if you're doing a mastectomy, you do frozen section of the sentinel nodes. If you find cancer in the sentinel node, you do an axillary dissection. Now, some people don't do that anymore and give radiation to the lymph nodes. That's a topic for another day. This is not for patients undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy or multiple positive lymph nodes. If they have three or more, is an area of controversy. If you find microscopic extranodal extension, you can still uh, treat them according to this protocol where you just do not do a completion lymph node dissection, even though you had positive sentinel node or two positive sentinel nodes with microscopic extranodal extension. So uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy, you all know what to do. Here's how we do it. I'm going to get, show you the pictures. Inject the radioactive tracer. Our technique uh, that we developed and published many years ago is inject the radioactive tracer in the skin, in the dermis overlying the breast cancer. Uh, 
it all goes the same place. If you don't know where it is, you can put it just adjacent to the nipple. Uh, here I'm doing five injections. You can I just put it in one place now. But make sure you raise a wheel and get it in the dermis. It makes the lymph nodes hotter than trying to put it in the breast tissue that also confounds your procedure sometimes. Blue dye is, uh, in, we used to put it around the tumor. I put it under the nipple is the current practice. Gives you bluer lymph nodes. It all goes the same place. Use a gamma probe, make an incision, usually at the bottom of the hairline, the level one axilla, a little bit anterior. Use a gamma probe. The machine makes noise, the counts go up. You find a blue radioactive lymph node. When you get through the clavipectoral fascia, take this out and send it for frozen section or not. As we talked about for mastectomy, you send it for frozen section and check and see. And if you have a positive lymph node, you're usually going to do an axillary dissection unless. You're one of the people who just wants to give radiation therapy to everybody who has a positive lymph node after mastectomy. There's a, it's another complex uh, discussion these days. So this is Breast Cancer 101, believe it or not, even though it was complicated enough. Here's just a sample of what was not discussed. Benign breast lesions, breast abscess, breast cancer in pregnancy, breast pain, management of positive lymph nodes at, uh, at the time of mastectomy, uh, and, and uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and hormonal therapy, a sentinel lymph node biopsy after neoadjuvant therapy, management of positive axillary lymph nodes after neoadjuvant therapy, post mastectomy radiation therapy, partial breast irradiation and intraoperative radiation, genetic testing, breast MRI, gene expression profiling and adjuvant therapy decisions, HER2 positive cancers and neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy, immunotherapy for breast cancer, locally advanced breast cancer management of local recurrence and quote unquote oncoplastic surgery which I think is uh, somewhat uh, uh, a way to justify billing more money for doing a lumpectomy and nevertheless I've uh, budgeted very little time for discussion because I've uh, gone longer than I anticipated LCIS DCIS and invasive cancer you have to practice this and learn it. Don't underestimate the complexity of breast cancer decision making and the importance of learning this and practicing it. Students and residents, go to breast clinic. That's the only place you're going to learn it. You know, lumpectomy and a mastectomy, there's two, op two operations you know, for breast cancer. You can learn how to do that pretty quickly. But you can't learn all that in the operating room. So thank you. There's a question or two. We'll try to make that happen. <clears throat> Dr. McMaster's Hiram Polk, would you comment yes, brief, briefly on the long term side effects of tamoxifen and chest wall irradiation? So, certainly, there's uh, with radiation therapy, there's a, a very small risk of associated other cancers like angiosarcoma. If you get that, it's very, very unfortunate. Uh, but fibrosis, uh, col uh, skin disc discoloration. Wound healing is never the same if you have to do a, a mastectomy after uh, a lumpectomy and radiation therapy. The risk of wound complications is higher. The potential toxicity to lung and heart, which is probably minimized these days with modern techniques. And uh, wound complications, especially if you give radiation therapy after mastectomy, you put it in a tissue expander or implant, eh, it's a challenging situation. So for the people who want to give radiation therapy after every patient who has mastectomy who often now have reconstruction. It will often ruin the reconstruction, increase the risk of uh, infection, tissue expander getting infected, needing to uh, have, have further surgery. And so uh, radiation therapy is no picnic and avoiding it or choosing wisely about when to use it is appropriate. Uh, hormonal therapy, you know, there's a one in four in 10,000 risk with tamoxifen of getting, uh, you know, uh, early endometrial cancer or uh, you know DVT and, and blood clots. Uh, osteoporosis is always a consideration when we're talking about uh, the difference between aromatase inhibitors and, and tamoxifen. Uh, and uh, the most troubling thing for most patients is the menopausal symptoms, hot flashes, other menopausal symptoms uh, from uh, estrogen blockade uh, that uh, often are most uh, troubling to the patients and can cause discontinuation of the therapy. Thank you very much. You're welcome.
other questions. Let's see who's on the line here. Dr. Ikai on the line? He must have a question. All right. Well, our time has just expired, so I apologize for taking too long and covering too much ground, but uh, you can see Breast Cancer 101, uh, it's complicated enough. So uh, we'll see if we can cover some other topics to uh, help with your education. But the way to learn breast cancer is going to conference, going to clinic, going to multidisciplinary conference, trying to help make those decisions. All right, we got QI conference.